Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for our October 2020 virtual breakfast. I see a couple of you eating. So thank you for joining and sharing with us this morning. Um, well, my name is Karen King. I'm with the Office of New Haven Affairs and our office holds a monthly community breakfast that was actually uh, created by uh, one of our speakers this morning. Uh, so we have him to thank for that for one of many legacies here at the university. Uh, we host these breakfasts on the first Thursday of the month during the academic year. We are hosting them by Zoom uh, until further notice. So uh, please, I will, I will send you, we will go over a link for you to get on our email distribution list if you haven't already joined us. I encourage you to do that if you haven't already done so because the login information changes for every meeting. Um, I have a few announcements before we get started. <clears throat> uh, Yale's, uh, so Yale, the campus is uh, pretty quiet. Everyone is uh, um, staying uh, socially distanced and uh, we aren't hosting in-person events, but there are still a lot of fantastic things that are happening, um, some of which we'll hear about this morning. Um, in other areas of campus, we have, um, Yale's Black Sound and Archive Working Group. They're going to have an event tomorrow from two to three. Um, it's about Woody Guthrie. It's a book that's written by Gustavus um, Sadler. And uh, I will put the link to the event in the chat box, but the title of the event is Race and the Politics of Protest Music. Um, it's gonna be about Woody Guthrie's music and racial politics. It's gonna be um, hosted by Professor Brooks and Professor Brian Kane. Also, the Yale Peabody Museum is hosting Fiesta Latina virtually this year. Um, so now through October 13th, they release content every Tuesday afternoon and Friday morning. Uh, every single program that they um, release is bilingual. It's accessible to people of all ages. And uh, I encourage you to visit that. I will put that link in the, uh, in the chat box as well. Um, and the Yale, uh, affinity groups, uh, and if you don't know about our affinity groups, they are employee resource groups that engage in advocacy and community building on campus. They also engage in um, service work throughout the city. Uh, they are hosting a, a free um, talk by Irena Ferguson um, titled Living a Good Life that's taking place on October 7th from noon to one. Um, Irena uh, raised her special needs daughter while she, um, while she received three degrees, one of which was at Yale. So certainly an inspiration, and I encourage you all to, um, to register. I will put the link in the chat and attend. Uh, a couple of other um, items. If you were at our September breakfast, then you saw that uh, I to let everyone know about the Yale Community for New Haven Fund, which is a fund that the university created in response to the pandemic. The fund it, uh, donates uh, funds to local nonprofits that are serving New Haven residents who are suffering from the ill effects of the pandemic. So if you go to our website, I will put this link in our chat box as well. You go to the top right corner and click on Yale Community for New Haven Fund. This will bring you to a page that um, has some additional information about the fund, and there's also a link to apply for funding. So please help us spread the word. Uh, we've, give, we've donated just over $2 million to over 120 organizations here in New Haven. There certainly is still an ongoing need and there's certainly still funds available. So please help us uh, spread the word on that. And one final note, last month, if you attended, you heard a fantastic presentation and discussion um, hosted by Judith Schiff, who is our resident historian, both for the university and for the city. Uh, she spoke about the upcoming Lansing Memorial um, statue that was being unveiled. The statue has been unveiled, and uh, if you have not been there, I encourage you to go see it. It is located approximately here behind the Yelp Health Pharmacy on Lock Street. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful installation by a fantastic artist, and it was driven by uh, people in the community, both on the, in City Hall and from the Amistad Committee, as well as a ton of volunteers um, who all made that happen. So I encourage you all to 
uh, go out and see it. Spread the word about Mr. Lanson, who's a, a wonderful individual who really needs a, quite a bit more. Um, he needs to be in a dialogue a, a lot more. So please help us spread the word about that as well. The, so uh, a few ground rules about the breakfast before we commence. As you can see, you all on mute right now. We are going to keep you on mute until the Q&A section. Once the Q&A uh, period arrives, you will be able to unmute yourself. You'll be able to ask questions verbally. You can also, I also welcome you to post questions or comments in the chat. And, uh, and we just ask that you wait for people to finish their questions. Uh, if you have a question that's specific to me, feel free to put that in the chat as well. Uh, but we, we look forward to the discourse that is going to come this afternoon or this morning. It is, it is Thursday morning. So our two speakers this morning are Melissa Barton, who is a curator of drama and prose for the Yale Collection of American Literature, which includes the James Weldon Johnson Memorial Collection of African American Arts and Letters at Bynagate Library. Melissa is a graduate of Yale College and earned her PhD from the University of Chicago. And Michael Moran, the gentleman who created this community breakfast, is the, community, is the communications director of the Beinecke Library. He is active in New Haven civic affairs, including current service with the New Haven Free Public Library Foundation. He is a graduate of Yale College and the Yale Divinity School. Please welcome Michael Moran. Give you some snaps, Mike. Thank you, Karen. Good morning, all brothers, sisters, neighbors, comrades, friends. When we started this community breakfast series back, and Karen and I, uh, went back and forth. It was probably around 2005 or 2006 when the Rose Center opened on Ashman Street. I know I would have been overjoyed to know that it was going 14 or 15 years later. And I would have been dumbfounded to learn that in one fall it was meeting virtually on something called Zoom and was a, a foodless diet uh, just through the screen. Uh, I am glad that some of you are eating breakfast. I'm in my office, so greetings from 121 Wall Street. And we're not allowed to have food uh, in our workspaces because it attracts insects, which are quite terrible for rare materials. Uh, we have had one change, a uh, positive benefit, which is we're now allowed to have water in, in the world's greatest spillless thing. So you may see me, this is, uh, for those of us who know rare, books collections, this is like an exciting thing that we can actually have water uh, in our offices, no coffee or anything else. Um, I did want to start, if it's okay, with Dr. Kimber and others uh, with a bit of an invocation. Uh, these are tough times and good times and bad times uh, we should call on the spirit. And I wanted to do it partly for the collections. I happen to have on my desk this item, which is uh, known as the Aitken Bible, A-I-T-K-E-N, which is the first full English Bible printed in the United States of America in 1782. So this is the first full Bible printed in the United States of America. Which, and this would be a remarkable uh, book, and there aren't a whole lot of these in existence. It would be a remarkable book, uh, regardless of its provenance, who owned it. But if you look sort of closely there, you can see that this belonged to and was signed by Mr. Roger Sherman, mayor of New Haven and U.S. Senator, one of the authors of the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, signer of the Articles of Associations, Articles of Confederation, who's buried over in Grove Street Cemetery. Uh, and it struck me that it would be worthwhile, and in keeping with uh, this, to read from uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily deter us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And so let us zoom with patience the presentation that is before us. I'm going to talk just for a few minutes and do a little uh, run through some of our digital offerings and then turn it over to my wonderful colleague, Melissa Barton, who many of you know um, from the work that she's done and shows that you've seen here. The uh, Beinecke Library uh, looks forward to the time when we can all gather on the mezzanine on a Thursday morning and have coffee and uh, pastries. And we look forward to a time we'll be, when we'll be open to the public again. That time is not now. Uh, 
but there will be a time in the future and we're planning uh, for new exhibitions for 2021. There are no exhibitions uh, up right now. And so we're planning uh, some exciting ex exhibitions and obviously I had to change things uh, beginning in March. We are open on a limited basis for research uh, for Yale affiliates as are all the Yale libraries and Barbara Rockenbach, the new university librarian and everybody across the Yale library system has done some extraordinary work. And of course, we're open all the time and have been always online. And that's what Melissa and I wanted to share a little bit about during these times. Our digital library has more than a million items on it. And we've added 200,000 images even since April 1st even in the strictest period of quarantine when everyone was working from home, Beinecke Library staff were working to uh, add to our digital library that's open to everyone, to scholars and students, to you, to anyone anywhere around the world who has an internet connection 24 seven. And so it really is a great resource along with other resources that we had to offer. Now, I said we have a million plus images, so we're not gonna look at all of them or most of them or even 1% of them today. And of course, as you all know, libraries don't exist to tell you things. We exist to allow you to explore and find things. And I wanted to share a picture of my third favorite library. My two favorite libraries uh, equal are the New Haven Free Public Library, of course, and the uh, all the Yale libraries, the Beinecke Rare Book, uh, and man, uh, rare book and manuscript library in particular. But my third favorite library is a little library designed by a Yale grad named Bill Richardson, who married uh, in New Haven, uh, a woman, Josephine D'Amato. And some of you may know Josephine, you, uh, those who know City Hall will remember Bob D'Amato, uh, who was her brother in the D'Amato's of Westville, I think. And so Joe and Bill met in New Haven and got married and moved to Whitesburg, Kentucky, where they've been for more than 40 years. And Bill's a great architect there. And he designed the library in Whitesburg, Kentucky, uh, which is very hard scrabble in far southeastern Kentucky. And it's named for Harry Cottle, who was a great writer of that part of the world, uh, wrote Night Comes to the Cumberland. And Mr. Cottle, before he died, uh, they said to him, Harry, you know, we're naming the library for you. And the library should say something. What should it say? You're a man of great words. And Harry said to them, uh, that's fairly simple. Uh, the library should say, and let me just hold on a second, I'll show you a picture, hopefully. The library should say, and I've been there a number of times, come look for yourself. So that's the theme of our talk this morning, courtesy of uh, Bill Richardson and Josephine D'Amato Richardson in Whitesburg, Kentucky. Come look for yourself. There's a lot to see here. And by way of introduction, I wanna take us to the Beinecke Library website. And one of the good things about Beinecke is we're not the Smith Library, the Brown Library. Uh, so if you Google us, you're always going to find us. But it's beinecke.library.yale.edu. And I encourage you to come look for yourself. We renovated, as it were, our website a year ago. You know, we renovated the physical building and reopened in 2015. And then we followed on with the digital infrastructure. And thank God we did. It stood us very well during these times where we've had the swerve to being all digital. And you'll find here very easy paths to find various things, in particular in the digital collections, where you can search all of those million plus items. And again, I'm not going to show you all of them, but I encourage you to take a look at this. If you're looking for something in particular, if something strikes you some morning, if you can't sleep, uh, if you're working on a project and you want to procrastinate, we have lots of material for you to do that. And there are a number of highlights. And again, when I say a number, hundreds of highlights. So I, again, have to underscore, come look for yourself. So you can find collections uh, 
within the library fairly easily and some various highlights, a few of which I wanted to point out. And so one is the Langston Hughes papers. And so this shows you, gives you a little introduction. There are links to the detailed finding aid, which will tell you everything that's in this collection. That's 800 pages long. And if you click uh, on that site, you'll see that there are more than what we would call a thousand parent records, a thousand records for digitized images just in the Langston Hughes papers, right? So just Langston Hughes, there's a thousand files. Each of those files may have uh, one image or it may have a hundred. So there are tens of thousands of images available in the Langston Hughes papers. Closer to home, as it were, in our own history, things that you can find that may be of interest are of more recent history. We have a great collection of the courtroom sketches of the uh, Black Panther trial from New Haven in 1970-71. We also have the papers of uh, attorney Catherine Rohrbach, including Erica Huggins' uh, prison correspondence. You, uh, those who were around during this time or know of it may know that the judge banned reporters from the courtroom. So this, uh, these sketches are actually the only record, visual record of the courtroom and the proceedings that happened there. So that's something of local interest. Uh, going back in time, we have the sketches of the Amistad captives that were done by an 18-year-old New Havener, William Townsend. And that again is a record that is uh, unique and extraordinary. And those are fully digitized. You can look at them, you can download them. So this is uh, those record and again, you can find them all on the digital library. Another 19th century collection that I wanted to note is the Amos Beeman scrapbooks. Amos Beeman was the first African-American minister of the Temple Street Church that became the Dixwell Church, the Dixwell Avenue Congregational United Church of Christ. We have scrapbooks that the Reverend Mr. Beeman kept that are a record of New Haven in the 19th century, Black New Haven in the 19th century, the Black Church, not only in New Haven because Beeman was a state and national leader in the Colored People's Convention movement in the church, abolition, so really amazing. And every Monday we have a program, it's now virtual, called Mondays at Beinecke, where someone talks about highlights in the collection. And if you go to our calendar, you'll find these. And I wanted to highlight and encourage everyone to sign up for the one upcoming on Monday, October 12th. So not this coming Monday, but a week, October 12th. And Karen, perhaps you can send this out also to the full list. Charles Warner Jr., a friend of many of us on this call, uh, chair of the Connecticut Freedom Trail, will be giving a talk about the Reverend Amos Beeman and about those scrapbooks. So I could go on forever, I'm not going to, uh, but also wanted to encourage everyone to take a look at our YouTube channel. We have added 100 videos, uh, short highlights videos and some longer form videos this year. So again, we are producing lots and lots of content that's accessible. These are ways to learn about the collection. They include poetry readings, they include curators. And many of you would have seen that we took our annual reading of the Declaration of Independence and of Frederick Douglass's oration that's come to be known, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, and put that online uh, featuring readers including Babs Rawls Ivy here, Eric Clemens, who had read when we were able to do this on site. And so the Beinecke YouTube offers lots and lots of things to see and to do. The penultimate note I wanted to make is if you're on Twitter, follow us on Twitter. Uh, it's a lively place where we share lots and lots of content that is timely 
and timeless. Uh, one that I would highlight is a tweet that was from a couple weeks ago with a draft and typescript of a poem called American Heartbreak 1619 by Langston Hughes. It, as you, if you can uh, stare at the numbers here, or if you go later and look online, has been liked and retweeted more than 7,200 times, uh, which in university Twitter is viral to an extent that uh, is unimaginable. And in fact, this tweet featuring Langston Hughes is probably the most retweeted and liked tweet to emanate from an official Yale account. And that I have to say gives me some great pleasure in any time that Langston Hughes is the most popular content coming out of the Yale Twitterverse. So if you're on Twitter, uh, follow us. We follow back, so uh, 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 I'll be happy to follow you as well if you're on Twitter. Uh, and if you need any further, Ava DuVernay thinks uh, uh, we're pretty cool. So, uh, and I think she's pretty cool. So, uh, and then the final bit, which all of you probably know, uh, but to, to reinforce, you can sign up to various email subscriptions around campus from a site that's subscribe.yale.edu. And again, easy if you don't remember that, easy to, to find uh, by Google. And then you can click through to various places, including the Beinecke Library. If you're not on our email list, you can send me a note and I'll get you on it, but you can also sign up uh, via this and then you'll get regular notes, for example, about Chaz Warner's talk, other programs we're doing, uh, and we'll make sure that when we do open sometime probably in 2021 to the four exhibitions, uh, that this group is the first one to know. But let me stop with that because uh, uh, I want to give uh, uh, quality and quantity time to Melissa Barton, who is, as Karen noted, the curator of prose and drama in the Yale Collection of American Literature and the James Weldon Johnson Memorial Collection of African American Arts and Letters. And Melissa has uh, an exciting preview of work uh, that's underway and, and uh, one of the newest collections. So, Melissa. Thank you, Michael. Um, thank you, Karen, for having me. And uh, good morning, everyone. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. I have some slides. That's the last one. Um, so um, I've been asked to talk today about a brand new acquisition that you may have heard about um, in the news over the summer. Uh, from a gentleman named Walter Evans. Uh, right at this point, Beinecke has three collections that once belonged to uh, Dr. Walter Evans. The one that I'm mainly going to talk about today is his collection of Frederick Douglass and Douglass Family Papers. But I would point out that he also has um, gifted to the university a collection of artwork by a man named Ollie Harrington, who I'll talk a little bit about at the end. And then uh, a number of years ago, uh, Beinecke acquired his collection, a small collection, but vital collection of James Baldwin papers. Um, so I'll talk briefly about those as well. Um, see if this works. Okay. This is a picture of, of Dr. Evans. Walter Evans, is a, he's a retired surgeon who lives in Savannah, Georgia. Um, he was a collector. He is a, a collector of not only rare books and manuscript materials, but really mainly of visual art of, um, uh, and, and has been a patron of artists in his, in his lifetime, um, particularly of Jacob Lawrence. Um, and Dr. Evans uh, met uh, Professor David Blight, who some of you may know and recognize in this photograph uh, with, uh, with Dr. Evans in his home. They're standing in front of a painting by a renowned African-American landscape painter named Robert Duncanson that hangs in Dr. Evans's home. He has an extraordinary art collection, some of which he has already um, given to the Savannah College of Art and Design and endowed a program in African American studies there. So he's a great benefactor um, and promoter of, of African American culture and African American, the study of African American culture. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Blight introduced us at Beinecke to Dr. Evans a number of years ago um, uh, because he, uh, in, in um, using and has written about this, um, uh, David Blight's biography of Frederick Douglass won the Pulitzer Prize last year. Um, it's a, a large and thoroughgoing um, account of Douglass's life. 
And um, David ta has talked about and talks about in the acknowledgments of the book how he would not have even undertaken a biography of Douglas had he not learned of the existence of Dr. Evans's collection of Douglas materials. So that group of materials was so important and so revelatory because though others, other historians have used Dr. Evans's collection and, and written about it, but the material is, is, is so you know, lesser known that it would be a, a tremendous contribution, um, mainly to the portion of Douglas's life after the Civil War. So, um, so uh, David Blight knew about this collection. You know, we began talking to Dr. Evans about it some years ago, and we finally were able to come to an agreement and acquire the collection this year, which we're incredibly excited about. So um, what's in it? The Frederick Douglass and Douglass Family Papers. These are materials that were mainly collected and, and maintained by Douglass's three sons. Um, his sons' names were Charles, um, Lewis, and Frederick Jr. And I think I've given those out of order. Lewis was the oldest son, the second oldest child. Um, Frederick Jr. was the, the third child and second son, and then um, uh, uh, Charles was the youngest. And um, so the, the bulk of the collection consists in, in scrapbooks, nine, nine scrapbooks that were kept by the family um, by various of those sons. Some, some of them were kept like jointly, like Frederick Jr. did some of it and Charles did some of it, um, uh, and, and some of them were collected, uh, done by individuals. Um, containing uh, newspaper clippings and ephemera about, the, about their own lives and about their father's career um, in the years following, mainly in the years following the Civil War, in the Reconstruction and post-Reconstruction years. Um, the collection also includes autograph letters from Frederick Douglass. We already have some autograph letters from Frederick Douglass in our collection at Beinecke, um, but there, there, here are more, um, and including some from uh, when he was living in Haiti as consul to Haiti in, at near the end of his life in 1889, uh, 90, and 91. There's a large collection of correspondence between Louis Douglas and his wife Amelia. Louis um, served in the infamous, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, deservedly famous and celebrated Massachusetts 54th Volunteer Infantry Regiment. Um, during the Civil War, the regiment that was depicted in the film Glory. Um, Lewis was wounded in that battle that is depicted in that film um, and uh, was, was uh, you know, a kind of important uh, uh, member uh, in, that, um, in that regiment. Um, uh, the, uh, these letters um, are extraordinary for depicting his, his experience in training um, in, the, in the army in, in those battles um, and then you know, in, uh, during Reconstruction in the very early years after the surrender of the Confederacy. Um, the collection includes the text of several of Douglas's addresses as recorded by the family. So these are curious documents there. Some of them may be the actual text that Douglas worked on before giving the address. Some of them may be the text as the family wished to record it after the address was given. There is a, there is a, te a, a text of the, uh, July 5th uh, speech that uh, Michael referred to, the 4th of July speech that was delivered on July 5th, 1852, um, it's typed. And so it probably wasn't created in preparation for um, typewriters became common kind of right after that. And so it would be an interesting project for someone to do some more digging, comparing these texts to other versions of the texts and kind of trying to um, kind of parse out what, what they are. Um, and uh, one of the uh, really high spot kind of uh, trophy pieces in the collection is this corrected manuscript of Douglas's eulogy for William Lloyd Garrison, his colleague, the abolitionist. Um, that's this, uh, if you can see my cursor, this in the lower right hand corner is right there. Um, so this is in, in, it's written in Douglas's hand and it is, it's, it's also has a manuscript correction. So it's pretty, pretty extraordinary piece. Um, the scrapbooks are full of newspaper clippings, but they also have manuscript annotations that is handwritten notations in them, uh, many of which are, are, are quite interesting. Um, the, this is a, a photograph, uh, just because I happen to have access to it, of family genealogy, which appears in a couple of places in them. So where the family is trying to record for, for their own purposes and for posterity, you know, when everyone was born and where. And um, so this is one example of that. This is um, one of the scrapbooks was kept by Frederick Douglass Jr. and has uh, 
uh, papers relating to his courtship with his eventual uh, wife, Virginia um, Douglas. And this is a dance card that is not filled out. I mean, I assume that she did dance with people at this dance, but the, um, but the dances are there. And you know, if you close it there, uh, you, there is a note on the front of it. So um, Virginia Hew Hewlett um, is her name. So there's a lot of family history that is, you know, uh, interesting history, not only because they are from a, a famous and influential family, but uh, interesting in itself as, as a 19th century family. Um, so uh, this is something that I'm often advocating for in uh, trying to maintain and preserve scrapbooks in our collections. The scrapbooks are often full of newspaper clippings, and for this reason, they're often um, uh, thought, it's often thought, well, all of that text is online already. Well, actually, it's not. And so here is just an example spread um, from one of the scrapbooks that includes articles about um, uh, uh, Douglas having given a speech about um, the uh, advocacy for uh, immigration of African Americans back to Africa um, in the post-war period. And um, of all the articles on in this two page spread appear from four publications and you can see that only one of these publications is available electronically by subscription for this date um, that's the new york herald and for the other ones some of them are partially available electronically but not completely and only one of them is available is held at beinecke so all to say these are newspaper articles that have been curated by the family about the topic of their father's career and al already for you so you don't have to search for them and we don't have them already so it's very exciting for both of those reasons um here's just a uh, uh you know way you can like see all the different ways that douglas was depicted and in the news in this period douglas is known to be the most photographed american of the 19th century the um, the most photographs of, uh, different photographs of him, um, but these are all a different engraving portraits of him and um, the different ways that he, he appeared in these publications. And the same one appears twice here um, in two different publications. And so you can see a lot of that kind of thing in the, in the scrapbooks too. Some more highlights. Um, the one scrapbook contains uh, letters from during the Civil War, including letters to Douglas from other abolitionists, Henry Highland Garnett, Alonzo Ranzier, Charles Sumner, um, the poet John Greenleaf Whittier, and Martin Delaney. So that is an extraordinary uh, piece. Um, in a matter of local interest, the letter that you see in the lower right-hand corner is a letter to Douglas inviting him to speak in Stanford in 1888. He was still, you know, made most of his income um, by lecturing in the in the post-war period, and so he was constantly traveling and lecturing in different locations. Um, and there's just tons of ephemera and photographs. The engraving that um, you see on the lower left, I, you might not be able to read that, but it's a picture of Douglas's home in Baltimore, and it says celebrities at home. So there is a kind of like celebrity uh, uh, home piece about Douglas, <laughs> which I find uh, amusing. So um, when is this material going to be accessible to you? Uh, right now, we are in the process of fully digitizing it. Um, so we expect it to be completely digitized and then available in the same interface that Michael was showing you. Um, ideally, well, certainly by next spring um, and, and maybe sooner. Um, but right now that process is, on, is underway um, and, and, and progressing very well. Our um, staff has been able to get back into the, our spaces and, and begin that work um, even over the summer. Um, it will be open to all everyone online, um, so you'll be able to see it that way. It will be available for reader research and teaching when we reopen and that, you know, any, anyone um, is, is uh, allowed to come into Beinecke Library to view materials. You don't have to be uh, an affiliate of Yale. You don't have to have any special credentials. All you have to be able to do is request the material, which we can help you with. So you're welcome to come and see the material in person. Um, we are planning to have an exhibition um, featuring Dr. Evans's collections sometime in the next several years. Our exhibition program has been on pause because of the pandemic, and so we're not quite sure yet when the exhibition is going to happen, but we hope to have it in the next few years. Um, so the other collections, um, in addition, uh, we have uh, Dr. Evans 
some years ago now, in 2014, we acquired a collection from him of James Baldwin letters. So there's about 100 letters, a little over 100 letters to three individuals. Um, these have been fully digitized. Um, uh, uh, so they are digitized. They are not available in the interface that um, Michael showed you because of, for copyright reasons, because the material is still under copyright, the Baldwin estate holds the copyright. And so we are able to give you copies if you ask us, but we can't put them on the open web. So I encourage you, if you are interested in seeing those letters, to ask us for the copies. <laughs> um, and, um, and then Ollie Harrington. Ollie Harrington was a visual artist of editorial cartoonist. He actually got an MFA from Yale School of Art in the late 1930s. And, um, and then spent most of his career doing cartoons for the Pittsburgh Courier, the great uh, Black Weekly. And this is one of his cartoons, which I think is uh, just wonderful. Um, and we acquired about 200 uh, original drawings um, of his cartoons. Um, his cartoons, uh, some of you may be familiar with him. If he, his cartoons featured a character named Bootsy, who is kind of every man character, much like Langston Hughes' character Simple, um, that appeared in his columns in the Chicago Defender. So we're very excited to have those as well. Okay, and so uh, if there are any questions, um, I would be happy to answer them now. I'm not sure how much time we have for questions, but, and also you're al always welcome to ask me questions about how to access material, how to find material, um, anything like that um, by emailing me when my email follows the usual EL formula. So I welcome, I welcome your questions. Get out of this. Okay, so you are welcome to put your questions in the chat. You are also welcome to unmute yourself uh, now and ask your questions directly. Uh, I have a hand up here. Hello. Go ahead, Dottie. Hi. Oh, hi, Karen. Do you have, um, oops. Do you have collection on African American women's um, uh, clubs from like the NCNW, that's mine, um, and some of the other colored women's clubs from the um, early 20th century and on? We like have, Dorothy Hyde, um, et cetera. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry to cut you off. Um, we do have the collection of a woman named um, Ella Barksdale Brown. And I'm not sure if she was a member of NCNW, but she was a member of um, several, of, of a great many um, civil rights organizations in the early 20th century um, and, and a member of the NAACP. Um, and she, and her collection has, is kind of noted for the organizational mail that she received. So, um, so that's a place that I would certainly um, direct you to, and I can, if, um, if you want to send me an email, I could look more into, into it and, and do some digging. Uh, but she is a person that I would, I would definitely point to. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's any, it, it's not, I would say because the James Weldon Johnson Memorial Collection, which is the collection that the Evans material is joining, um, is primarily a collection about literary history, um, and art, art history, although we do care deeply about the history of black politics and, um, and, and advocacy. Another place to look would be in our clippings file. Um, we have a very robust clippings file. And again, you know, I'm, I'm a huge advocate of clippings as opposed to searching newspapers online. And um, our clippings file really dates from about 45 to 85. So that those dates might be a little late uh, later than what you were thinking of, but um, but that might be a place to look for that organization too. So I would be happy to, to look at, if you would send me an email, I can get back to you. I mean, right, generally I wasn't just looking for NCNW, but just that um, era of women um, and you know, some of the people that were connected to them, whether historically or artistically, yeah. But thank you, I'll do that, thanks. Yeah, and that clippings file has really great material for those, especially from 45 to, I would say, like 1970 is it's real, like, and, and for many, a great many, um, uh, a great many figures, uh, are, they kept, they kept clippings and other ephemera about them in that period. And then there's always a lot to be seen in, in you know, who was writing letters to Langston Hughes. We have those letters that he received and, and other kinds of avenues, too. 
take the opportunity, Dottie, to and, and all to note in terms of great women and a woman who is not as broadly known as she should be will be the uh, focus of the Mondays at Beinecke Talk this coming Monday, October 5th at 4 p.m. with our colleague and leader, E.C. Schroeder, the Beinecke Library Director. He's going to be speaking about the papers of Dorothy Porter Wesley. And if we were to do a poll of this group, I wouldn't be surprised if Melissa and I are the only ones who know who Dorothy Porter Wesley. If there are any Howard alums, they, they might know. She was the longtime, uh, longtime leader at the library and an organizer of the library and black history collections at Howard, a major force in black bibliography, uh, extraordinary person and her papers are here. So I uh, would encourage that. And there are, as, as Melissa noted, the Ella Barksdale Brown papers, the papers of Margaret Bonds, uh, again, someone who, uh, extraordinary person, perhaps not as much of a household name. And then as Melissa noted in the clippings files, and Melissa, maybe you could also note uh, Umbra Search, uh, because I think this is a group that would be interested in that resource. Yeah. Um Umbra Search is a is a, a unified search. It was founded at the um, University of Minnesota in their libraries, and they've created a search engine, um, and it's Umbra like a shadow. UmbraSearch.org um, is its URL, and it searches uh, repositories across I think to over 200 repositories, including really big ones like the Library of Congress and um, and you know and us and then and then smaller ones that still have extraordinary materials and it's a really great way to try to do a broad ranging search across different institutions for for materials. Um, I'll put that in the chat as well. I'm putting a few finding aids that that we've mentioned in the chat um, right now. Uh, there's a question from Harriet in the chat. Is there any information on the African American women who participate in suffrage? So I think, you know, I would say the 19th century is uh, is not an area of 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 broad strength of, of breadth in the James Weldon Johnson Memorial Collection. So the, the acquisition of uh, Dr. Evans and Zuckles collection is is wonderful for us because it, it really improves our breadth where um, for, uh, otherwise we, what we do have is a, a really, really wonderful um, printed holdings of things that were published. So uh, books and pamphlets that were published uh, in the 19th century, we have really great materials. Manuscript materials, um, we don't have a ton of, of material in the 19th century. Um, I, uh, so in, the, in, in, in that chapter of the suffrage movement. And then I would say maybe the same is true um, all the way up to, you know, 1910 or so. So, um, so yeah, I would have to think about where that material might be found. Um, but I, again, encourage you to send me an email and then we can, I can do some digging and get back to you about it. <laughs> and, and both on, on that topic and generally in the, the come look for yourself, Many people would know, but want to make sure everybody knows that the Unison, the Union Yale Library catalog is called Orbis, O-R-B-I-S. You can find it at uh, through Google. You can find it. There's a, the ways to search. So that's everything in all the collections, including Beinecke Library collections. We've digitized a lot, but we haven't digitized everything. We do digitize on demand and a lot of what the staff working on site now are doing for teaching and for uh, general scholarly and public requests. So lots is not digitized, as you can imagine, it's a big collection, but uh, we do digitize on demand. So you can go to Orbis and keyword search, subject search, and again, uh, Melissa and I and, and uh, uh, anybody at Beinecke is happy to help if you reach out directly, and then the website will get, guide you into the way to search, and, and uh, that's a way, and we'll link you if it is already digitized. Uh, but again, if it's not digitized, we are able to do that on demand. My question is, um, do you have, um, do you have a general um, category, uh, a, a category of 
black women, because there's so many that we don't know about that we wouldn't be able to request them by name. Yeah, it's a great question. And it's, a, it's, um, it's certainly a challenge in doing research in archival material because um, in uh, the way we catalog things in the library, we would certainly have um, a, a, a subject heading um, that would probably be African-American women, um, um, but I would need to double check what it is, that you could search under that subject and find things that are related to that subject. Um, and, and a lot of those things would be printed books, um, which is not to say that they are easily available. Some of these printed books are very rare, but um, when you're talking about manuscript material like letters, um, scrapbooks, those kinds of things, we do, we do give those same, we do label those uh, objects with those subjects, but it's always much easier to find things if you know a name. And it's, it's, it's very challenging. Um, what I would say is that there are um, there are places where you can you can search for those subjects, and then once you know names, you can kind of try to go back to the searches and kind of go around and around finding finding names, and then and then you know looking at things and finding more names and searching again. So um, so we do we do try to use those categories, but um, but you know I don't I wouldn't say necessarily that the African American women subject is on Langston Hughes's 650 box archive, um, even though a great many uh, black women are represented in his collection. There are letters to him. There are three folders of letters to him from Zora Neale Hurston. There are letters to him from Lorraine Hansberry. Um, there are many letters to him from anonymous fans. So there are, you know, a lot, um, um, Audre Lorde and, um, many, many people, <laughs> Maya Angelou, they're are represented in his papers. Um, so, um, so it can really help to um, talk to someone or to, um, to know some names. And, and again, I'd, I'd fall back on the come look for yourself. Uh, <laughs> libraries are places that are stewards, but the material is alive when the Thomasina Shaw's of the world engage with it. And you're as likely to find something and tell the rest of the world, frankly, as we are. So this happens all the time. And this is sort of like the, the raw materials, the laboratory. And it, it frankly, we, we love people engaging with the materials because that's the way they come alive. There was an article published earlier this year about uh, Frederick Douglass argument related to uh, income inequality that was deep in one of Frederick Douglass's newspapers. And so it was, it's not that it was hidden and it's not that, you know, unknown because when it was published, it was known and people read it, but it took a scholar coming into our collections and looking at and sort of uplifting that for the rest of the world. That happens a lot. And sometimes it won't be on the top level bibliographic. And, and as Melissa noted, you know, sort of dive down into the collections. And I wanted to share my screen again about uh, a piece that we have that ballad in me, an historical sequence by Langston Hughes. We will be releasing a video this week of a short play that Langston Hughes did in 1956 for encouraging people to vote, register to vote and vote in a presidential election. And this is one where, again, it's not that this is unknown, it's included in the, the 16 volume uh, collected works of Langston Hughes, but I sort of stumbled upon it in my calling these boxes and going through, and it then leads to learning about Dorothy Maynard and the Harlem School for the Arts and St. James Presbyterian Church, and it, it's one of those sort of magic, wonderful things that you sort of start somewhere. You might end up a different place than you thought, and you find out all kinds of things. So that that's a a bit of a rambling uh, come look for yourself, but we really rely on special collections like this, the kinds of people who are on the Zoom and, and uh, friends and scholars from all over to, to join us in, in diving into the materials, whether it's online or when it's possible to do that on site and in person. Yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't stress enough how much we learn from the collections, how much I personally learn, learn about the collections from researchers and from researchers' questions um, and from my colleagues like uh, the great Mike Moran. So, you know, I, I think that um, there's, a, 
there's a way in which uh, we can kind of help each other with your, you know, we can help you kind of explore your question using the tools that exist. Um, because all of those tools are always so idiosyncratic to a specific library. And so we can definitely help with that. And then, and we learn so much from what, what we find with you. So I think, you know, I, I, I definitely echo Mike's invitation to please come and look, please, please talk to us. Um, we, we are here to help you. And, you know, while we're not open, there are ways that you can find things about the collections in the work that's published. Uh, we both have it. Wow. Uh, and this actually, if, you know, if, if you're interested in Zora Neale Hurston or Langston Hughes, which I bet a lot of people here in one or the other, uh, and if you're interested in both, you may know they were, they were as, as uh, Yuval's thing said, they were best friends. And spoiler alert, that didn't last. Uh, so there's interesting drama to be had, and and, and this really uh, came out. Uh, a lot of came out of uh, uh, Yuval Taylor digging into the collections here, finding things that uh, were not broadly known, and then publishing it and making it available to all of us. So this is a, a good example of of how that process works and benefits uh, the world. There is a question in the chat from Aaron. What is the meaning of the Voynich manuscript? Uh, you tell me. <laughs> so the Voynich manuscripts, for those who don't know, it's fully digitized. Uh, and again, you can find it, go to the website, uh, scroll through the collections highlights. It's uh, known to be, you know, the, the sort of century it was done, we can know based on the scientific evidence. It's a, what's known as a cipher manuscript um, and it's actually quite beautiful uh, the the drawings and they are drawings botanical drawings largely and, and medicinal uh, of no plants that are known to exist so it's this sort of fantasy and it uh, uh, has not been solved and so it, it's definitely one of those ones if you uh, find yourself uh, up at two o'clock in the morning and and uh, can't go back to sleep, uh, Voynich Manuscript is there for you. <laughs> Fully digitized. We have time for one more question. Or comment. Seeing none, I want to thank you all for I, joining us. Oops. Oh wait, we have one person. Here I am, Dottie. Dottie, but, okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to run, but I. Daddy, your connection is a so much here, but all of the. Mike, you're the. You're oh, thank you, Karen, for doing all of these things. And Mike, you're Yale's Renaissance man. And, um, you're everywhere and all things, it seems, to this community. Oh, to our community when it comes to Yale. Um, I don't know if it's gone. Is it gone? I'm sorry. Um, you're still I can't here. Hear myself. Oh, okay. Um, and um, to Melissa, thank you. This was really a wonderful, to me, just exciting to have the invitation to uh, enjoy the Buying Keys collection again. So it's always just wonderful. It makes me happy. Thank you. And Thanks, Karen, Jay, all of us. Yeah, no, thank you all. I mean, it's, it's great to, to gather in, in, you know, in person, as it were, this way, and we really do look forward. Karen, can I do it? Can I do it? Since I did an invocation, can I do a benediction? Please. And I'm going to do it. Uh, uh, secular scripture. This is uh, the Dream Keepers, uh, Langston Hughes. And this awesome. is one of probably, Melissa, what, three or four copies of this book that we have that he owned. So again, this is sort of magical because it is Langston Hughes's copy uh, of this book. And if you uh, look closely uh, at this, uh, you'll note it was his reading copy. So he, he, this is what he had on the road when he was doing reading. So let me read uh, from Langston Hughes's copy of Langston Hughes that he used for public readings. Uh, this is a poem I think that, that many would know. Um, it's a, the, the book itself is beautiful. It has uh, beautiful illustrations in it. Um, so our, our uh, in uh, benediction uh, for now and, and for all times. Dreams, hold fast to dreams for if dreams die, 
Life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams, for when dreams go, life is a barren field frozen with snow. Mr. Moran. As always, wonderful to spend time with you and hear you speak. Thank you so much, Melissa, for joining us today. We certainly learned a lot. I encourage everyone to reach out to Melissa and or Mike uh, for further connection to Beinecke. I will share um, the links that were um, certainly shared today, but we always ex uh, encourage you to go and see for yourself online now, at least for now. Uh, we hope to see you next month. We are our uh, breakfast will be held on Thursday, November 5th. And uh, feel free to reach out to me if you are not already on our mailing list. Thank you all. Have Thanks, a Karen. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you so much, Karen. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.